Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. Apologies for the delay between episodes. My editor is currently on holiday, and I'm absolutely useless without him. That's also why there's no video to accompany this episode, so sorry if you're on YouTube watching this. But this isn't a very visual episode anyway. This is going to be a very talky episode. It's kind of like a classic episode, really. There's going to be a lot of history, um, a lot of discussion of academic terms in there, because today's episode is all about socialism with Chinese characteristics. So my aim for this episode is really to define what that term means, and also to kind of give a history of how that terminology has evolved over the last 40 years or so since it's been in use in China. Like I said, this is quite um, an academic episode just talking about ideology, so hopefully those of you who are long-term listeners and who like that kind of stuff will enjoy this. I know there are a few teachers who listen to this podcast as well, so if you are teaching modern China studies and you want to sort of define terms like this, hopefully this episode will be useful for you, and I'll put some timestamps in as well to sort of help guide you through the episode. So let's start with a definition of the term, which actually proved relatively elusive. There are lots of different definitions. Uh, The writing on this topic is not really that great. It's either very pro-China and anti-West or the complete opposite where it's very anti-China and, you know, anything China or socialism is awful. So I'm going to try and give a relatively sterile definition without trying to either praise or demean the model of socialism with Chinese characteristics. I guess the main approach that I'm taking is really just reading through what the Chinese Communist Party have said themselves, looking at their plans and kind of dissecting those documents and the words of different leaders. So the term socialism with Chinese characteristics was actually first coined by Deng Xiaoping in 1982. And the concept of socialism with Chinese characteristics was essentially an attempt to redefine the relations between planning and socialism and the market economy and capitalism. The idea is to sort of preserve institutions of socialism and public ownership while also importing the more sophisticated management experience and advanced market mechanisms from developed countries. As Deng Xiaoping put it himself, Planning and market forces are not the essential difference between socialism and capitalism. A planned economy is not the definition of socialism because there is planning under capitalism. The market economy happens under socialism too. Planning and market forces are both ways of controlling economic activity. The existence and growth of private ownership does not necessarily undermine socialism and promote capitalism in China. Development is the absolute principle. We must be clear about this issue. This definition from Deng's perspective is a lot more about the way in which China can move forward, the way it can develop, advance and become an advanced and modern society. So his definition is very much focused on the economy because obviously in the 1980s, China was still relatively very poor and was looking for ways to kind of bring its economy up after having failed with several other types of development model. However, over the years, the concept has expanded to cover every aspect of China's political system. So domestic politics, foreign policy, society, culture, economics, science and technology. This is because initially the policy was just developed to address people's very basic needs and bring up the general overall standard of living within China. Whereas now the focus is more on the reform of institutions so that China can become an actually prosperous society where everyone can live a good life. Obviously, a key question here is why the use of the term with Chinese characteristics? So the main reason that that's sort of been tacked on the end is partly to differentiate it from the Soviet system. So we've spoken in previous episodes about how the Sino-Soviet split saw um, China and Russia move further apart from each other after they had ideological differences in the 1950s. But really, the division between the two countries began to emerge during the Long March and the Zunyi Conference in the 1930s. So this is when Mao Zedong became supreme leader and sort of began imposing his own ideology and started pushing out those Chinese Marxists who had actually studied in the Soviet Union and trying to push a development model that was more suited to 
what he called China's state or China's base state. The with Chinese characteristics idea is essentially allowing China to take its own path and develop at its own pace using the resources that it has at its disposal. There are lots and lots of related terms that are going to come up, um, but I'm not going to list them all out at the beginning. I'll try and cover them as they come up throughout the episode. But one thing that I do want to outline, because I think it's really key, is the idea of the five-year plan in China. Because I feel like the five-year plan and socialism with Chinese characteristics are two inseparable ideas. So if you don't know what the five-year plans are, essentially they are the method of planning mainly China's economy, but over time um, other aspects of Chinese society and Chinese politics. And this was adopted by the CCP at the very beginning of the regime in 1953. That was when the first five-year plan was instituted. And it also reflected the close bond between China and the Soviet Union at the time, because obviously the five-year plan model was lifted straight from the Soviet Union. The fact that China still uses the five-year plan model till today is very important because it's actually one of the, I would say, one of the relatively few key direct references to the early days of the PRC that lets you know that the CCP is still the same party, it's still the same machine, and it still has the same power that can control the destiny of the country. There are lots of things that happened in the early PRC, like mass campaigns or having a fully centralised, fully planned economy that, you know, those things don't really happen anymore. So the fact that the five-year plan model has still carried over and is still actively enforced, I think is quite noteworthy. So within these five-year plans, we can kind of see updates to socialism with Chinese characteristics. Obviously, the plans are every five years. They're drawn up by the Central Committee of the CCP, which is the second highest commanding body after the Politburo. And these plans set the work to be done by every official and every civil servant in the country, as well as anyone else who has work that is governed by the state. So state-owned companies and increasingly tech companies, research scientists, anyone who's basically responsible for helping the government achieve its goals. Five-year plans are an embodiment of socialism with Chinese characteristics, and they also serve as that reinforcement that the CCP is the only body within the country that can direct and guide and drive the country forwards. So now let's cover how the idea of socialism with Chinese characteristics has evolved over the past 40 years. So we're going to go through the five-year plans, but not every single one. We're going to do some time jumps. Mainly what I want to cover is the way in which each of the preeminent leaders of this period, so Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping, have tackled the idea of socialism with Chinese characteristics and embodied it within their own thought and therefore into the constitution of the PRC, and then how that has shaped the way in which China has developed over the past 40 years. So like I said at the beginning, during the Deng Xiaoping era, socialism with Chinese characteristics was very much focused on growth and reform. It was very much an economic plan, and you don't really have that much discussion about things like stability or equity, those sorts of ideas that are more common now. The sixth five-year plan was sort of the big famous plan that launched the period known as the reform and opening up period. So it began in 1978 and was adjusted and finalised in 1980. It was formulated mainly by Deng Xiaoping with also help from Chen Yun and Li Shenyan. If you've listened to the history episodes of this podcast, those will be familiar names. But um, if you don't remember or you haven't listened to them, essentially Chen Yun was a very gifted economic planner who was um, working all throughout the Maoist years, but he stayed very much out of the limelight and he was more aligned with Deng in wanting to have sort of more market forces and a more open economy that was less prone to centralised planning. And then Li Xianyan was a famous military leader and, and also an economic planner, and he was actually president of the PRC during the 1980s. It's during this period that you get a lot of um, 
famous sayings that you guys might know are from Deng Xiaoping. So things like people should get rich first or crossing the river by groping stones, which basically means that you should feel the way without going too fast. I think a lot of people think that China at this point was trying to race ahead, but actually when the initial growth plan was set, the growth rate was set at between 4 and 5%, and Deng Xiaoping had actually planned for a balance between production and consumption. And there was also quite a lot of balance between the planned economy with market regulation, but the economy actually ran away from the plan. So that actually showed how the underlying potential of China's economy had been sort of suppressed during the Maoist years. And when market forces were unleashed, even a little bit, it quickly was, you know, people were very quickly ready and able to take that up and sort of take advantage of market capitalism as much as they could. In terms of the successes of the sixth five-year plan, Apart from just the economy taking off during this period, science and technology and education and culture also flourished. 33,000 major scientific research achievements were achieved and 50% more students enrolled in higher education institutions. So people weren't just hungry to make money, they were also hungry to sort of explore education, develop art, culture, science, all of these sorts of things. The total number of labourers employed in cities and towns in the five years reached more than 35 million. The sale of commodities and people living in urban areas increased rapidly as well. And we've discussed in previous episodes how urbanisation really took off as soon as, you know, the 1980s began. So there was really fast growth, not only in just the overall economy, but also in people's lifestyles, especially people living in urban areas. However, in this period as well is where you see a lot of the problems that we see in China's economy today begin to start peeking through. So the first thing you have is the overheating of the economy, right? So things moving too quickly, too quickly, essentially. There was a problem of income distribution, so uh, regional inequalities or just um, inequalities between urban areas and rural areas started to really get exacerbated and it's still a problem that we see today. And then obviously the fact that the growth rates were exceeded put a lot of pressure on the population, on companies to try and, you know, do we keep going? Do we keep trying to exceed the growth rate? Do we, you know, try and get more and more every year does the line have to keep going up so these are the things that get addressed in the next five-year plan which begins in 1985 they still wanted to have that balance between letting the planning not restrict economic growth but also allowing people from outside the government so people from you know uh, industry or scholars and you know actually have some input in the plan and come up with new ways to you know control growth without also limiting the potential of the economy so in this period we also see the development of the special economic zones again we've spoken about that on a previous episode on urbanization and the special economic zones also reflect the fact that foreign policy was starting to be more incorporated into politics at least into the economic side of China's political sphere and with the development of economic zones you also get the higher investment in things like biology space exploration IT stuff energy oceanography all of these sorts of things that required higher skills maybe foreign experts and especially foreign direct investment as well. So China sort of not trying to limit itself to just growing through manpower alone, actually exploring more efficient and advanced technological solutions. However, despite the fact that the government was trying to rein things in, essentially things continued to run away from them because they weren't willing to put as tight a leash as they should have on especially financial companies. The problem was that the government was giving out a lot of loans and we spoke about this again in the episode on urbanisation about how the government was giving out loans so that things could develop more rapidly, especially in urban centres. And in 1987, this leads to a really high inflation rate taking off um, due to an imbalance in the total of production versus consumption. So according to Yin and Xu, 
First, due to the increase in the money supply, the shortage of consumer goods and price gouging from some enterprises, prices soared in 1987, from 5% in January, 9.1% in December, and 7.3% on average for the whole year. This led to a decline in people's real living standards. Secondly, the decline in per capita grain production and the excessively rapid growth in industrial production resulted in a continuing imbalance in the ratio of the industry to agriculture. Finally, capital investment remained large and many unplanned projects launched or were in progress with the problems of excessive waste, irrational structure and poor efficiency in the construction field being prominent. So the government introduced a slew of policies to try and rein in inflation, but in 1988, they also introduced reforms to relax state control over prices, which triggered panic purchasing nationwide. This inflation in the economy, plus growing inequalities between different regions and people just generally, and also the corruption that people witnessed in their daily life of the government and different sort of people who benefited from the state's lending policies, led to a complete collapse in social order, which then led to the Tiananmen Square protests of 1989 and eventually the Tiananmen Square massacre. So obviously this was a huge setback for the CCP. This was kind of a turning point for them as well as to whether or not they would incorporate democratic principles in their governance or continue to be as authoritarian as possible. Now, it's important to note here that this was also kind of a transitional point between Deng Xiaoping and the next set of leaders. One of the people who was potentially going to be the next leadership was a man called Zhao Ziyang. However, because of his tacit support for the protesters in Tiananmen Square and his advocacy for greater democracy in the government, he was quickly sidelined And in fact, he was imprisoned in his home for the rest of his life, including the period after Deng Xiaoping had actually passed away. So he was just like completely removed from society. There's a very good biography that he dictated himself and smuggled out through his daughter to get typed up. And it's it's really interesting. It's a very interesting read. But after the 1989 incident, the CCP basically decided to double down on authoritarianism while also trying to solve the underlying problems. So they were trying to gain greater stability, gain greater equality f- between people, solve all these social issues while not having to give up on any of their own power. And so in the 90s and onwards, we see a shift in the sort of economic focus of the socialism with Chinese characteristics and the five-year plans to a more comprehensive theory that aims to deal with all the different aspects of Chinese society, including essentially how to incorporate people into that plan, so not seeing China as just its economy, but also the sum of all of its people. So in the 90s, this is when Jiang Zemin takes over. He's very much a sort of disciple of Deng Xiaoping. And he praises Deng Xiaoping thought or Deng Xiaoping theory as sort of the foundation of socialism with Chinese characteristics. So in his words, under Deng Xiaoping, peace and development have become the main themes of the times. On the basis of reviewing the historical experience of successes and setbacks of socialism in China and learning from the historical experience of the rise and fall of other socialist countries. For the first time, it has given preliminary but systematic answers to a series of basic questions concerning the road to socialism in China, the stages of development, the fundamental tasks, the motive force, the external conditions, the political guarantee, the strategic steps, party leadership, the forces to be relied on, and the reunification of the motherland. It has guided our party in formulating the basic line for the primary stage of socialism. It's a fairly complete scientific system which embraces philosophy, political economy and scientific socialism and covers, among other things, the economy, politics, science and technology, education, culture, ethnic policies, military and foreign affairs and the united front and party building. So that kind of sounds like a load of ideological waffle on the surface, um, but there are some key points to sort of pull out. The first of which is you could probably tell that in this new theory of socialism with Chinese characteristics, the party is trying to encapsulate the entire of society. So everything from education and culture 
to um, party and ideology and governance, to the military, to the economic front, to foreign affairs. So everything now has to come under the party's remit and be planned at least centrally, even if it's not executed at a central level. Another thing to note is that line where he says that Deng Xiaoping thought has been has guided the party in formulating the basic line for the preliminary stage of socialism. So at this stage, China is still considered to be in the early stages of socialism. I think that's quite important because obviously under a socialist system, um, if you're thinking sort of in terms of Marxist theory, then socialism is sort of like the pre-communist stage where you don't need leadership anymore. But under socialism, you very much need leadership, preferably a dictatorship of the people, which is what the CCP claims to be. And finally, in the last bit, you see elements of the idea of rejuvenation of the Chinese state, where he talks about the reunification of the motherland. Um, So when this speech was made in 1997, you're kind of in the midst of the handover of Hong Kong and Macau back to mainland China. This is really a formative step in China's internal and external affairs. It shows that, you know, China will take back its rights and will take back its land and kind of gives them the uh, precedence to do so, which is, some people would argue, why we're in the mess that we're in today with Taiwan. In 1997, Jiang Zemin outlines three major areas for improvement. Those being balancing the market economy with the century planned state owned economy, improving social stability and the rule of law, and raising the cultural, educational, and scientific levels of the people. As we move forward through time, you can see that in comparison to the earlier fifth through eight year plans, the tenth and eleventh five year plans, which run from 2001 to 2010, have a much broader and more comprehensive remit. So they address things like IT infrastructure, environmental protection, regional inequality, research and development, resource management, educational enrollment and old age provisions. By the time we get to 2012, which is the end of Hu Jintao's tenure as general secretary of the party, the GDP of China has already reached 47.3 trillion yuan. So it's massively expanded. So the purchasing power of the country has hugely expanded, urbanisation has advanced, the country's market system has improved, and things like taxation, banking, science and technology, education, medicine, public health, all of these public institutions, financial institutions, have all raised in terms of quality. In line with the 10th and 11th five-year plans, the military has also been modernised, and what Hu Jintao refers to as work related to Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan affairs has been further strengthened. There's also been major improvements in the party's theoretical strength, and according to Hu, achievements have been made in studying and applying the scientific outlook on development. So the scientific outlook on development is essentially just another way of saying Hu Jintao thought. It basically defines development of China as the primary task. So it's supposed to be like a people-centered outlook that aims at the sustainable rejuvenation of Chinese society. Again, it's supposed to be a balanced development, hence the scientific nature of it. It's supposed to take everything into account and balance all the equations and dot all the I's and cross all the T's, etc. So it's balancing the urban with the rural, economy with society, and balancing the development of every region equally. The ultimate aim is to create a harmonious society, but further than that, it's also to rejuvenate China and to restore it to its so-called rightful place in the world. I always think this rhetoric is not too dissimilar from Wilhelm's place in the sun rhetoric when you're talking about Germany towards the beginning of World War I. I don't think it's as belligerent, although I could well be wrong. We haven't seen the outcome of China's aims for its rightful place on the world stage yet. But in general, both ideologies can be seen as sort of forward thinking in that respect, trying to get a better global position for the country. So as we move past 2012, it's time for the new era of Xi Jinping thought. So you've probably heard of Xi Jinping thought. The actual full name is Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. 
So this is Xi's 14-point plan to guide the party in its role in leading the nation in terms of politics, economics, society, culture, military, science, and foreign affairs. I will quickly run through the 14 points as they've been summarised by official Chinese state media. So they are ensuring party leadership over all work, committing to a people-centred approach, continuing to comprehensively deepen reform, adopting a new vision for development, seeing that the people run the country, ensuring every dimension of governance is law-based, upholding core socialist values, ensuring and improving living standards through development, ensuring harmony between humans and nature, pursuing a holistic approach to national security, upholding absolute party leadership over the people's forces, upholding the principle of one country, two systems, promoting the building of a community with a shared future for humanity, and exercising full and rigorous governance of the party. So you'll notice in those 14 points, the top and tail both refer to um, the party specifically. So the first point is ensuring party leadership over all work. The last point is exercising full and rigorous governance over the party. They kind of signify that not only is the party the governing body, but the party is also something that needs to be governed. It's something that constantly needs to be kept an eye on. You make sure that the party is on the right ideological track and then that party is then fit to guide and lead the rest of the country. So it's kind of ensuring stability on both ends. You can't have a well-run country if you don't have a well-run governing party. There are some points in there that are a little bit woolly. For example, upholding core socialist values. As we've seen, those kind of get redefined whenever convenient for the party, whenever the party needs to change direction a little bit or institute a new set of laws or rules or, you know, has a different outlook on, say, foreign affairs. And again, certain points that we've discussed earlier are reiterated. Taking a more humanistic, people-centred approach, uh, the one country, two systems, promoting a national reunification, strengthening of national security and uh, the military. National security is kind of, I wouldn't say new under Xi Jinping, but it's definitely something that's emphasised more. And we see examples of this in real time. For example, uh, the national security law in Hong Kong or the kind of extreme measures that are taken in China during lockdown, during Me Too protests and things like that. So Xi Jinping thought is supposed to be divided into two sort of long-term stages. The first stage is from 2020 to 2035, so we're kind of in that now. And that's devoted to the realisation of socialist modernisation. So things like achieving a good outcome for the Belt and Road Initiative, which we'll discuss a bit more in a bit. And then the second stage from 2035 to 2050 is to develop China into a great modern socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious and beautiful. Obviously here, something to note that democracy does not mean what we might think it means in, you know, if you live in a socialist democratic country or if you live in sort of like a two-party democracy or a multi-party democracy. It doesn't mean sort of like a direct vote by the people for their leadership. It more means something like the people can be a consultative body. There is something literally called the People's Consultative Conference in China, where not so much members of the public, but members of different classes uh, can have their input, can suggest laws, have their input on laws, um, suggest changes and amendments to certain things. And and then you also have local elections for... um local officials in smaller towns and villages and things like that in China but nothing on a large scale nothing like a national leadership vote or anything like that and that's not what the party really means they mean more taking people's input and then making decisions based on that input something to note about these plans as well is that there is obviously significantly less emphasis on the economic aspect of things it's not just because China has come so far despite the size of the economy it's still not a wealthy country there's lots of inequality and there's still quite a low gdp per capita but it's more that xi jinping is of the opinion that you know there are rich men who have taken over the economy and there's too much corruption and everything just needs to be reined in a little bit and then we go back to those two principles of the party being in charge of everything and running everything so even again it's this balance between the planned economy and the market economy even if the party isn't running things so to speak, they should have oversight of major developments in the economy. And again, we'll look at a couple of examples in a bit. 
In terms of the humanistic aspect of the plan, Xi Jinping's use of like a grand narrative is a little bit different from his predecessors. So there's, you know, there's something that he's formulated called the Chinese dream. This is more of a nationalistic sentiment. It's definitely more of an appeal to nationalism than we see in previous um, in previous leaders' ideals and ideology. I think part of the reason for this is that she can no longer really rely on like a straightforward ideological indoctrination as the Chinese public really is a bit more sophisticated than they were in the past. They, they're they better educated, they're well-rounded, well-traveled, they've been introduced to consumerist culture and they're now also taking part in sort of global highs and lows, things like the COVID pandemic Uh, economic slumps they're much more integrated into the global system and have more knowledge of how different things work around the world so they're less susceptible overall to just pure indoctrination because they have that access to different information i think that's part of the reason why xi jinping leans so much on nationalism including things like reunification and stirring up tensions with major rivals like the us promoting harmony with smaller developing nations and also positioning China to be a global leader, both in the geopolitical sphere, so things like brokering a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and also positioning China as a superior trading partner, as we see with the Belt and Road. So to kind of summarise that historical overview, essentially what you have is each of the four leaders' ideologies and thoughts being incorporated into socialism with Chinese characteristics to kind of morph it over time. So with Deng Xiaoping theory, you've got a big focus on opening up on political and economic pragmatism and reunification of China in the first instance. Then Jiang Zemin's three represents are about balancing the conflicting interests of different members of society to make sure that the CCP can ensure its long term legitimacy. And I think something that I didn't mention earlier is that actually during Jiang Zemin's era, people who were previously not allowed to enter the CCP, like entrepreneurs and a certain number of intellectuals, were allowed to join the party. And so that really represented a shift of the CCP from just focusing on workers and like really strong Marxist rhetoric where like capitalists are evil to reintegrating the so-called black classes in with the red classes in China and trying to heal those divides to make a more harmonious society and also understanding that these people do have a role to play Um, if you want to have a strong and developed economy you do need forward-thinking entrepreneurs people who are talented in business and also intellectuals to contribute to policy making um, in different arenas. Then Hu Jintao's scientific outlook on development is about creating a well-rounded, well-off humanistic society based on science and sustainable development. And then Xi Jinping thought, which is the era that we're living in now, is reinforcing the idea that China is a socialist nation and that the CCP and its ideology has complete leadership over all aspects of governance and society. So how is socialism with Chinese characteristics actually implemented into Chinese politics on a day-to-day basis. So we've talked a lot about the economy, so I think it it would be a good idea to sort of look at different aspects of China's economy to understand where the ideology comes into play. Just general, in ter- if we're thinking in terms of, okay, socialism with Chinese characteristics means balancing the planned economy with the market economy, we can see in China that state-owned enterprises account for around 60% of China's market capitalization and generate around 40% of China's GDP. So state-owned enterprises still make up a really important part of China's economy. And even though there are really big corporations that make up over half of China's GDP, the government often owns what's called golden shares in these companies. So where the party can gain board representation and or veto rights for key business decisions for these companies by owning just one or two controlling shares. So in this way, the government and the party still exercise their right to rein in, say, any monopolistic companies or individuals who run companies who they feel are moving too far away from party lines. We also see that the party is trying to maintain a balance between taking advantage of market economics to propel China's growth with authoritarian control and state monopolies 
and using that to create a sort of artificial stability we've seen and we've discussed in previous episodes about certain aspects of china's economy that are not so stable for example the housing market but because the state maintains so much control over financial institutions and legal institutions they can basically force private companies to take certain measures to prevent economic meltdown and then just step in to prop up any weak parts We also saw this with the deposit crisis last year where local banks uh, had been using people's savings in speculation and essentially lost all of their money. These instances reveal just a single layer underneath the surface. If you crack the veneer, there's like all this corruption, lack of financial regulation, lack of a clear structure. And there's often very little recourse for victims. You know, as we discussed in the episode on China's housing market, there are many people who are still waiting for unbuilt houses where the companies have just taken their money and not built their homes. But the government, the party is able to suppress any negative press about these issues and stop the voices of the victims from getting out whilst continuing to prop up these companies in the hopes that I guess the problem will be solved or maybe they are working to solve the problem, but often they do these sort of artificial measures to try and rectify the situation. For example, like removing the people who were in charge at the time that the problem emerged and then putting someone else in and being like, see, we took away all the bad corrupt people. So again, it's creating this, it's kind of like artificial semblance of stability without actually creating a sort of long-term sustainable system that would be able to run without the party continually intervening. If we look at another aspect of socialism with Chinese characteristics, like rejuvenation, we can look at something like the Belt and Road. So the Belt and Road Initiative, as we spoke about in the episode on this topic, is not just an economic venture, uh, where China's trying to, you know, strike up new partnerships and deals with other countries. But it's also part of China's plan to take its rightful place in the world as both a trading partner and as a reliable political ally and as a general alternative to major Western powers, particularly the US. We spoke about how China's Belt and Road tends to target smaller, weaker nations with less power in institutions, say like the UN, but who tend to be resource rich and have iffy ties with major Western powers. For example, they might have been a colony in the past, or they might uh, be a dictatorship or have a political system that uh, major Western powers don't particularly agree with. So I won't go through everything that we talked about in the Belt and Road episode. You can go back and watch that if you want to to apply your brand new knowledge of socialism with Chinese characteristics to that example. But I just wanted to read out a little bit of a description that I quoted in that video. So the core content of the Belt and Road is to promote infrastructure construction and connectivity, align national policies and development strategies, and achieve common prosperity. Regional hotspots continue to be in turmoil, Terrorism spreads and rages, and large-scale flows of refugees and immigrants have a prominent impact on the world economy. Peace deficit, development deficit, and governance deficit are severe challenges facing all mankind. Today, when countries are interdependent and global challenges are emerging one after another, it's difficult for a single country to be alone, nor can it solve the problems facing the world. Only by aligning with each other's policies and integrating economic factors and development resources on a global scale can we form a synergy and promote world peace, tranquility and common development. So obviously an important point to make there is that China's not just talking about economic integration, but also to an extent political integration, or at least aligning policies. And obviously in that it would mean that say, if you are a democratic country and you want to trade with China, you will have to change your policies to, you know, bypass any say, outstanding human rights requirements that you might have or requirements around the country's uh, government operating in a certain way, which tend to be requirements that are held, again, by major Western powers that China doesn't necessarily hold over other countries. The Belt and Road system, again, is also another example of a system or an idea or policy that's centrally designed but um, decentralised in its implementation. So the CCP oversees it 
and you know Xi Jinping pronounced it and he, it was his idea but they don't actually run any of the projects directly which also gives them some kind of leeway say if anything goes wrong they can kind of back up and be like well that wasn't us it was this rogue company so again the the ccp is always giving itself a little bit of leeway either to be like yes this is our idea it's our it's we are the reason that it worked out aren't we so brilliant but also if something goes wrong being like oh it was these people stepping out of line they're part of china but they're not necessarily part of the system they weren't following the rules even if the rules were sort of so loosely defined that technically they could be interpreted any way and the problem is more that the person or the company institution in question got caught as opposed to the fact that they were transgressing any rules in the first place. So to wrap up this episode, what does the 14th five-year plan, which will run between 2021 and 2025, hold for China? Well, the aims are to triple per capita GDP to around 30,000 US dollars per person, alleviate regional inequality and focus on domestic consumption to reduce China's dependence on foreign markets whilst also increasing foreign direct investment. So this is something that's called the dual circulation system. It has quite a lot of China analysts worried. I've noticed people talk about this a lot as something like, oh, well, Xi Jinping's got his belt and road and his dual circulation. But yeah, it's basically, again, part of Xi Jinping's both his nationalistic policies and his policy for national rejuvenation. So again, while he wants China to become a major trading partner, he wants people to consume more domestic products. It's kind of like a Brexit strategy now that I think about it, like still wanting lots of foreign investment and foreigners to want to come to your country and do business with, you know, your institutions. But at the same time, being like, back off, this is our island. Um, So yeah, I don't know if anyone agrees with that comparison, but that's just kind of struck me how, you know, how these sorts of nationalistic policies are becoming more popular now, especially now that the world, I think, the economic system, the the reliance on uh, capitalism to always produce more and always make the world a better place is kind of like dwindling and people are, are looking to other things other than just consumerism to make them feel fulfilled and happy, I think. A lot of governments are like, well, let's try nationalism. Maybe that will work. Other areas of development include working on China's carbon neutrality goal, which it hopes to reach by 2060. And it also hopes to improve water conservation and make half of all cars on the road electric vehicles by 2035. China also plans to be the world's largest electric vehicle provider. So we will have to see where that goes. I was thinking of doing an episode on that, actually, because I saw someone had posted a video. I think it's Serpenza, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, um, but I saw it on YouTube of like a um, a huge field of electric vehicles in China, just like completely abandoned. And I wanted to look more into that and look more into the electric car and electric battery industry in China. China is also planning on increasing research and development and tech investment, uh, particularly in high tech sectors like semiconductors. And we discussed reasons for that in the episode on Taiwan as well. So actually, if you go back to pretty much any episode that I've done on modern China, you will be able to see that socialism with Chinese characteristics can be applied almost as a lens. I think that's really what I'm trying to do with these newer episodes is use socialism with Chinese characteristics as the lens through which we analyse China. How can we see China through its own eyes? What are the differences between how China is viewed from within and how we as Westerners or Western critics or Western lovers of China see China? And can those different viewpoints be brought together to create um, a more sort of objective or holistic view? I don't think it's possible to achieve true objectivity especially when you don't have all the information, right? A lot of the time we're relying, say, on statistics from China, uh, whether that's about their economy um, or the demography or the environment, whatever it is. So it's difficult just to get the basic information a lot of the time, which is why there is so much dispute around China. But I think one thing that we can reliably rely on China to do and China's leaders to do is always tell us what their plans are. They're always very, very upfront about what they want, what they want to do. Um, They kind of just say it and then do it. They don't really have like, I'm not saying that 
they don't use double speak or they don't ever have bad intentions or they don't try and trick and lie and scheme like all politicians do but i think people should you know there are some things with china that you can just take at face value when they say they want national rejuvenation they mean it so that's it for this episode guys i hope you enjoyed it i'm sorry if i sounded um less energetic towards the end my voice is going because i've contracted an illness from my family members but hopefully by the next episode i'll be feeling a bit better and a bit more chipper i'm debating between two different topics for the next episode i'm thinking either doing one on the chinese education system so things like what it's like being a child in china what is school like uh what's it like being a parent of a child um especially in today's economy and it's very very competitive in china you know been reading lots of stuff about mothers who like give up their entire lives just to like get their kids through school it's very interesting or another option is to talk about china's fast fashion brands so if you are an internet user you've probably been seeing this online retailer called timu pop up a lot this is like another china it's like the western pin door door basically which is like um like their amazon basically or like an aliexpress as well yeah basically just one of these like online manufacturers outlets and just talking about other different fast fashion fast lifestyle stores um shein is another one and i kind of wanted to talk about how you know people are always discouraging other people from buying from them you know like this is all really bad for the environment and it encourages like really negative consumerism and like bad labor practices and things like that but i wanted to talk about how like what is the impact of the western market on these companies are they just like companies that have popped up out of nowhere or are they actually part of like larger strategies and like what if everyone in the west stopped buying this stuff would it even make a difference and will these fast fashion companies ever really go away so those are the two that i'm picking between if you have an opinion you can email me i'll also i think i'll put a poll on youtube as well or on twitter if you follow me there to find out which ones you guys would prefer to hear next so yeah do check out the um twitter page which is sinobabble i also have a sub stack i know i haven't updated it in a while i'm sorry everything's been a mess over here but I do have a newsletter coming up, so that should be out in the next week or so. And yeah, I also have a YouTube channel, so head on over there if you want to see more community posts from me where I do a few more updates. But yeah, that's it from me this week, guys. I hope you enjoy the episode, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.